In this lesson, we'll go over the DaVinci Resolve grading system, its versions, and the basic application settings. DaVinci Resolve is not a plugin for a different editing program, that is, it's a standalone software. That does not mean that DaVinci can't work with other software and vice versa. As we'll see later, there are several ways of incorporating it among other applications in your post-production process. Since 2009, DaVinci Resolve is developed and owned by Blackmagic Design. The company currently offers it for Windows, Mac OS X and Linux operation systems. An average user would use the Windows or Mac versions, since Linux is sold exclusively as a complete grading system together with a large control panel, so this version is intended for the larger post-production studios. For each, the Windows and Mac OS X, there are two versions of the program, DaVinci Resolve and DaVinci Resolve Lite. DaVinci Resolve is a full software version you can purchase from your Blackmagic products distributor, or it also comes as an accessory with a number of Blackmagic design cameras. With the full version, you also receive a USB authorization key that provides you with a license to run the application. The software itself does not have a serial number or internet activation. It can therefore be installed on several computers and is licensed by inserting the USB key into the desired device. If, however, you simply wish to test the software or do not need the full DaVinci Resolve options, then the light version will suffice. Since differences between the two versions have been changing in the last four years, I will not list them in detail. You can find the current list on the software manufacturer's site. Perhaps just a note that the current DaVinci Resolve Lite 11 version does not include image noise reduction, stereoscopic support and material monitoring or export in resolution higher than Ultra HD. If you do opt for the DaVinci Resolve Lite version, you will find the installation file on the manufacturer's website, under Support. The version has its own installation file, which means that the program does not switch between the full and the light versions, depending on whether the USB key is inserted in the computer. Here you will also find regular updates for both versions of the application. In terms of hardware, DaVinci Resolve follows the same basics as with any other video application. Powerful hardware brings better comfort. The two most important areas are the disk storage speed and the graphics card parameters. If you plan on grading high resolution material or material with higher bit depth, you will need a fast storage disk, either using an external one or having at least several internal hard drives connected to the RAID system. Surely, the use of SSD disks will significantly increase your chances of reaching the desired parameters. To measure your storage disk speed, you may, for example, use a Blackmagic design application called Disk Speed Test. The application will also list the formats you can play in real time. You will not find here all resolutions and formats, such as RAW or the less data demanding codec H246, but using simple math you can easily reach this type of playback. So if you do own a fast disk, you will not need to use lower proxy resolutions when grading, which in turn will not slow down the hardware performance right at the point of input, that is, when uploading images. For color corrections as such, the DaVinci Resolve application primarily uses the resources of your graphics card. In previous system versions, NVIDIA cards were preferred, but in the latest application versions, the support of ATI graphics cards has been added. DaVinci Resolve is one of the few applications that can fully utilize several graphics cards. The use of a simpler graphics card for a software interface and a more powerful card for operations intended for actual grading. Two graphics cards are not a necessity for the application to run, 
It can significantly accelerate working with the program. When selecting a graphics card, we particularly check two aspects. The number of so-called stream processors, in case of NVIDIA the number of so-called CUDA cores, and the card's memory capacity. For Ultra HD, you should use cards of at least 3 GB. If you're really serious about grading, the output image monitoring is another extremely useful addition. For this type of video preview, you need at least two components, a Blackmagic design monitoring card and a high quality monitor. Most Blackmagic design cards with SDI and HDMI outputs are compatible with DaVinci Resolve and it's only up to you whether you choose the HD1080 monitoring format or a higher one. It also depends on monitor selection. Surely, 4K monitors are more expensive than HD monitors, and at times it is appropriate to prefer image quality and genuine effect to image resolution. The Sony OLED monitors are clearly the best choice for their exceptionally precise color reproduction. The OLED technology also ensures realistic black color, which generic monitors never reproduce as truly black. Other outstanding professional monitor manufacturers include Panasonic or Bonn. The preview resolution does not affect your work on projects with higher resolution, for example HD 1080. The DaVinci Resolve system is in fact designed so that when you're working with, for example, an Ultra HD input material and plan on exporting the same resolution from the application, it is not necessary to create and monitor the whole project in Ultra HD. An HD project and an HD preview may be sufficient for making all the necessary image adjustments. The final format and the output video resolution are in fact determined only when exporting files. As I have mentioned, the most complex DaVinci Resolve version for Linux is sold with a sizable control panel. That, however, doesn't mean that this type of application control cannot be used with the Windows and Mac OS X versions. In fact, other control surfaces such as Tangent Wave, Tangent Element, Avid Artist Color or JL Cooper Eclipse can be used with the full program version as well as with DaVinci Resolve Lite. Program installation is really easy and quite similar for both Mac OS X and Windows. A local database necessary for DaVinci Resolve to operate properly is installed on your computer together with the actual application. It serves for the management of projects and users. The local database does not require any further configuration and if you don't need to remote connect to other DaVinci Resolve systems, or other databases, you can let it out of your mind. In case you decide to update your software, the local database saves both your projects and the user list for new software installation. The initial application window is quite simple. We see that three users may log into the software, the administrator, me as a user and a guest. Since the program access is password protected, you can change your password regularly. Here you can also add or change your picture. The new user button is located in the left bottom corner where you enter the name and password and you can also add a picture. In the right bottom corner of the window, you will find the database manager button. In the manager we see that the system is set to one local database. As I have already mentioned, in case the need arises, from here we can connect to other databases located on other computers in the network. A new project manager appears after logging into the application. By double-clicking a new blank project, we can begin working on a new project rather quickly. If, however, we wish to name the project right at the start, we do so using the assigned button and save the project in our database. Also, when dealing with more projects, 
we can sort them into folders. A project is moved into a folder with a simple drag and drop of the mouse. Just note that a project marked as current cannot be moved this way. Such project can be moved into a folder only when a different project is open and therefore marked as current. After you first open the application, it is advisable to check or change certain settings under the Preferences tab. Under the first item, we can check if the system recognized or whether it supports our graphics cards. My system currently runs only one graphics card that serves for both the graphic interface and the processing of color corrections. The second item serves the setting of disk space for storing images in a gallery or for the cache files. These are auxiliary renders that the program is able to generate in more complex scenes in order to replay the video in real time. With powerful hardware that is a particularly efficient graphics card, the cache files won't be needed at all. But DaVinci Resolve also operates on less robust computers where the cache files prove truly useful. In the previous program versions, this was the point where it was necessary to also add all the remaining disk spaces from which you'd intend to load your video files. A cool setting was added in version 11, which automatically shows all your connected disks with a click. On a related note, if you do set several disk spaces, the program will choose the top place in the disk list for storing cache files and galleries. The next item is for the settings of the Blackmagic Design Output card, be it for conventional or live grading. The remaining settings are self-explanatory, but one notable item is setting the first graphics card in your system. That is, when using multiple cards, you will be able to determine whether the first card, the one that is primarily intended to display user environment, will participate on color correction processing. In other words, you choose whether you'd like to use this card's stream processors as well. Because if the card is of significantly lower quality, and really intended only for graphic environment display, and has, for example, only 48 CUDA cores, while your other card has nearly 2800 CUDA cores, it is advisable to leave the whole processing to the second card. Next, we can set whether we will be using CUDA technology or OpenCL. I can say from experience that currently it is more effective to use cards that do support CUDA technology, that is NVIDIA cards, but this trend may change in the future. Next, we can set the use of the control panel. And the last item is for setting text parameters, which cannot be set in the program itself. But this part is unimportant, and we don't need to discuss it further. If we made changes in the settings, we will be required to save them before closing the window, and the program alerts us that the changes will be applied the next time the program starts. So, we have set up and checked the application, and now we're ready to set up our first project. One extremely important parameter, which has to be set before we start working on a particular project, is the timeline. It's because if, while working, we create an incorrect timeline, say, with a different number of frames than we need, so, for example, Instead of 25 frames per second, we create a timeline with 35 frames per second. We will later not be able to change that parameter. So, be really careful about this. You can change a lot of the parameters while working. But this one is fixed, and the only way around it is by creating a new timeline with the right parameter. Many other project parameters may be familiar from other video applications, therefore I will not elaborate on them, perhaps just a warning that if you use interlaced frames, that is interlaced video, you should set them in the project as well. Video monitoring should have the same parameters as your project. You may be deciding which output to choose, whether 25p SF or 25p. Some monitors are unable to play the progressive 25 frames per second format. 
These are mainly monitors with an HDMI input port. 25PSF is a format that uses two identical half frames for playback, that is the output card sends 50i format into the monitor. This format can be replayed on all European monitors. Clearly then, if you're working with half frame material, you'll be setting the 50i format right at the start. Just as a reminder, the fact that we've set our project in full HD format and we'll be monitoring it in full HD as well does not mean we won't be able to work with a higher resolution material. We are still able to use for example Ultra HD and can export in it at the end. I personally consider this one of DaVinci Resolve's great advantages. The next tab is used to set image size changes, that is the way our images will scale if we are using a video with higher resolution than that of our timeline as input. In other words, it is the algorithm that determines how an Ultra HD video, for example, should be compressed to full HD size. This parameter can be changed while working on a project. For example, when our system isn't fast enough for real-time playback, we can switch the parameter temporarily to a simpler algorithm. It is therefore only a temporary setting, used for monitoring. As we'll see later, we can set the required higher quality when exporting our video. The same applies to quality settings when working with raw material. Further, we can set up how image edges are processed when the image is compressed, so-called anti-aliasing. Personally, I prefer to switch off the function completely. What happens sometimes is that when anti-aliasing is on while an image is scaled, Dark edges the size of one pixel are created around it. In the bottom part of the window, we can set the reduced definition size for our input files, the so-called proxies. We will not be using them in this tutorial, but very briefly, they are for working with high resolution files. Let's say we are working with sequences of DPX images in 4K resolution as our input data, but our hardware is unable to play back or graphically process such large data. DaVinci Resolve can recalculate such data into lower resolution, with which we can work seamlessly. When exporting at the end, we'll exchange these proxies for the original full resolution data. I will return to the rest of the settings in the following lessons, when it is more appropriate. For now, let's finish with those which have to be set before we start working. Here we can set the format for cache files, that is auxiliary renders I have mentioned earlier. Simultaneously, we can set up and check the file location paths intended for cache folders. We can further turn on and off the traditional automatic project save function. And in the next item, we can edit keyboard shortcuts or select the set of keyboard shortcuts we wish to use. Finally, our settings can be saved under a specific name and used automatically with each new project. In this lesson, we've covered the basic system settings for DaVinci Resolve and we are now ready to start working on our first project.